the Tokyo Olympics will be remembered as the first one to happen without a live audience. That's of course because they took place amid a global pandemic. Perhaps not unrelated to that pandemic, they'll also be remembered as the first games where athletes frequently spoke about their mental health. That pertains most famously to Simone Biles. Biles, who's thought to be the greatest gymnast of all time, pulled out of four events citing difficulties with her mental health. She has since announced she will be competing in Tuesday's Beam Final. As we talked about on the show last week, the decision to withdraw drew criticisms from the likes of Piers Morgan. We won't go into that as we did that last week. You can check that out on our YouTube channel. In terms of opening up, about mental health, Biles has now been joined by Adam Peaty. Adam Peaty is probably Britain's most high profile competitor at these games. He's won two golds and a silver in Tokyo. That includes gold in the 100 meter breaststroke, which he also won at the Rio Olympics. After the wins, Peaty announced he would be missing September's International Swimming League, I hadn't heard of it either, to look after his mental health. Like Biles, PT also received some flack after announcing the decision. Sharing an article about that move, he tweeted, Reading some of the comments in response to this is why we have such a stigma around mental well-being in sport. It isn't a normal job. There is a huge amount of pressure. Money does not buy happiness. And then he goes on, I'm taking a break because I've been going extremely hard for as long as I can remember. I've averaged two weeks off a year for the last seven years. Unfortunately, there are people out there who think they know you more than you know yourself. I should probably add, I mean, other jobs do have lots of pressure. So while I completely back Adam Peaty's decision to take a month off to focus on his mental health, he probably shouldn't justify that by saying that being a sports person is not a normal job because I I would like every worker to be able to take a month, month off because all jobs tend to be fairly stressful. But We'll, we'll put that to one side for one second. Finally, um, and perhaps most dramatically, we can go to Raven Saunders. Saunders is an American shot putter who made Tokyo's first podium demonstration after winning silver in her competition. Saunders said the X sign, which you can see her making there, represented the intersection of where all people who are oppressed meet. Saunders, who is 25 and gay, has frequently spoken about mental health struggles, including considering suicide in 2018. On doing the X gesture, which is expected to fall foul of the International Committee, International Olympic Committee's ban on political demonstrations on the podium, Saunders said, I really think that my generation really don't care. At the end of the day, we really don't care. Shout out to all my black people. Shout out to all my LGBTQ community. Shout out to all my people dealing with mental health. At the end of the day, we understand it's bigger than us and it's bigger than the powers that be. We understand that there's so many people that are looking up to us that are looking to see if we say something or if we speak up for them. I should note, in case it wasn't clear when she's saying we really don't care, she's saying we really don't care if the IOC tell us we can't protest on the podium. Not I really don't care about uh, all of these social issues because clearly she does. Ash, we often talk about how responses to mental health problems in society can't be purely symbolic. We need material solutions, good housing, good jobs, good pay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These kind of messages from elite athletes do also matter they don't they it is quite refreshing to see these elite athletes who are heroes for so many people coming out and saying look i'm i'm struggling too and i'm, I'm going to be open about that well i think what's really important is for us to be able to look at both of those things at once that of course you need to address the material underlying causes which either make people much more vulnerable in terms of experiencing mental health issues um factors which make the experience of mental health issues issues much more severe and then also the availability and the accessibility of proper mental health care right i think we need to look at that as well as the fact that there is i think this quite profound cultural shift when it comes to destigmatizing certain aspects of mental health issues and mental illnesses by young people in the public eye, either in the field of the arts, music, entertainment, or indeed sports, these two things happening at once. Because I do think that what we're seeing is that you've got a generation of young people who in Britain and in, Amer and in America are in quite a profound way disempowered in the electoral process. And both of those 
elected power structures tend to represent not only in their composition, but also in the representation of interests, older voters who tend to have more socially conservative views, but also are more likely to be financially secure. So looking at rates of home ownership, savings, all of that kind of thing. Um, I'm not saying that every single baby boomer is rich. I'm saying that these things break down um, along generational lines. Not only is that where young people are dominant because that's where young people have always been dominant. I think the growth of social media has also shifted power within that realm because no longer does um, an athlete like Raven Saunders have to go, well, how do I impress, you know, these really nasty, really reactionary, you know, editors and producers and the people who shape broadcast and print media. You've got a direct line to your following and your fan base because of social media. And you've also got, I think, a, a kind of shift of power away from broadcast and print media outlets who now know that they've also got to follow the story as it unfolds on social media. And that, I think, is really powerful when it comes to achieving cultural shifts, changes in norms, values, and viewpoints. So while I think we've got, in many ways, a deepening of all of these factors which have created a mental health crisis for young people, the rise in precarious forms of employment, the decline in stable housing, uh, the fact that we are in a very volatile political situation, uh, the climate emergency on the horizon, all of these things um, can really uh, fuck with your mental health. You, I think, also have this area in which people feel empowered to speak out and not have to kowtow to the kind of norms which dominated broadcast and print media and I've said this before that's why you have people like Piers Morgan ultimately trying to make a name for themselves by being a reactionary backlash against that shift in norms but it's the scream of the imminently defeated Piers Morgan knows that this isn't going to be something that he can win it's something he can in the short term capitalize on for no variety but he can't win it because you've got your Raven Saunderses you've got your Adam Peaties you've got your Simone Barses and you've got you know um you've also got you know Tyrone Mings who today was speaking out about his experiences with mental health issues anxiety and having you know real trouble around the start of the Euros um this is I think a generational shift in norms it might just take a while for it if it ever does to manifest in a change in politics proper Mm. No, I think that's really important, especially that, I mean, you know, g generational divides, people yeah. sometimes find them controversial because they say, oh, well, look, I'm of an older generation. I'm open about mental health and I'm, you know, actively anti-racist if what we're talking about is football players taking the knee. And obviously that's absolutely true in, in, in many of these cases. But I do think one thing that's interesting about sport and culture is in a way it does pick people out quite randomly. You know, it, it is genuinely meritocratic. The Olympics is genuinely meritocratic, at least the popular sports, not those sports that actually probably only 10 people do in each country anyway. But <laughs> the popular sports are, gen sorry to anyone who does the pole vault. Sorry for the dressage enthusiasts <laughs> yeah, out you know there, what I mean? but like, it's not a meritocracy because only five How many people, people do, do it? it? <laughs> um, it's quite, I assume it's quite easy to qualify for these things. Don't, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. In any case. And you, um, know, you get a horse, Michael. You get a horse yeah. and tell me how easy it is. Popular sports are genuinely meritocratic. So it is interesting that you've taken this sort of random cross section of society when it comes to the Olympic team or when it comes to the English football team. And they are all people who are, you know, quite in tune with communicating anti-racist values, quite in tune with, with, with sort of communicating their solidarity with people suffering from mental health struggles in a way that I'm not convinced would have been the case, you know. 40 years ago or even even 20 years ago. Potentially it would have been and they just didn't have the social media to make that communication. But I do also think that probably perhaps social media has changed th those norms within that uh, that generation. I suppose, I mean, in a way, I'm sort of rephrasing what you've already said, Ash, but just just to emphasize what why I think generational analysis is is important when it, when it comes to issues like this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like, because one, it allows you to express yourself more authentically, all right? I also think that in terms of how celebrities now use social media, it had this big shift towards, you know, being handled by management and publicity. And then the pendulum swung back because actually what celebrities like is having a direct link to their audience and not having it be so managed and curated. Um, and then on top of that, I think you've also got, 
you know, a huge extent to which power is now just no longer um, dominated in a public relations sense by, you know, the old gatekeepers of respectable discourse. Um, and I think that a generational analysis, it doesn't explain everything, but I think it explains an awful lot about why we are at this kind of tipping point when it comes to mental health advocacy. Um, one thing that I would like to add, though, is that I think it's important to acknowledge that this project of destigmatization is very, very partial because the kinds of discussions around mental health that it's seen as acceptable to have, it tends to be around depression and anxiety rather than the kinds of, you know, very layered, very complex presentations of mental illness which also involve things like substance abuse or schizophrenia the way in which all of these things can then overlap when there isn't adequate care and support with homelessness and you know rough sleeping and all sorts of behaviors which can fall under the bracket of you know the deviant the criminal or the dangerous so one of the things that I always say be wary of with celebrity mental health advocacy, um, the insistence of it's okay not to be okay, is that all of that is happening within certain constraints and certain limits. So if what you want to do is have a conversation about how do you support people in their experiences of mental health crises, thinking about what it is that's being asked for by celebrities, which is a more hospitable and a stigmatized environment, that's only one part of what needs to be there. There's this whole other realm of, I think, quite complicated institutions and support structures which need to be in place um, to catch those people who have those kinds of experiences with mental health which you don't see reflected in celebrities. Mm -hmm.